Okay, here we have our conspiracy theories. And this is what I'm going to talk about in about 20, 30 minutes, about political theology, semiotics, paranoia, the sublime, underground politics, postmodernism, overground politics, networks and media. This is roughly the field of conspiracy theories and the cultural theory that I'm trying to sketch. So, speaking of political theology, um, conspiracy theories, they are quite old, as Stephen said in his introduction, but it's actually a modern term. It was coined by the philosopher Karl Popper, who might be known to you as a German-English philosopher of liberal rationalism in his 1930s books, um, Open Society and Its Enemies. Um, and of course, that was a critical coinage because he was defending liberal society against totalitarian politics but that were based on conspiracy theories. As a practice, uh, conspiracy theories, of course, are much older. Um, well, for example, if we take the beginning of the 17th century, uh, when the famous uh, Rosicrucian manifestos were published as anonymous, anonymous uh, pamphlets, um, and immediately there was a huge resonance all over Europe, especially among academics who uh, wanted to fi find out who these Rosicrucians are and what their conspiracy is about. Um, after that, the whole uh, concept of conspiracy was mainly applied to secret societies, like, for example, the Freemasons and, of course, the Illuminati. And then, since the 19th century, and this is where we get into problematic territory, to whole parts of the populations. Jews, if we, we uh, uh, speak of anti-Semitism, um, after 9-11, also to Muslims. And reciprocally, I would say, in Muslim countries, also to Christians, if we speak of political Islamism. So what we could say, what we could draw from this, is we take this whole history from um, Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, to 9-11. I would say that conspiracy theories target gray areas between religion and politics. Um, one could say that um, they are based on an assumption that just as in religion you have the exoteric, the visible, and the esoteric, the hidden, um, the same is true for politics, namely that you don't just have exoteric politics, the visible uh, official politics, but you also have an esoteric uh, politics, a conspiracy, the real politics underneath the visible politics. And um, if we take political anti-Semitism as perhaps the largest and most influential conspiracy theory, then also that there can be esoteric politics underneath both exoteric and esoteric religion. Um, so what this means is that this whole field of uh, conspiracy theories pushes us into the realm of political theory, and I'm a bit theoretical and abstract in this first uh, uh, section, but I promise it will uh, get better. So political theology, this is a term whose modern understanding was coined by um, the enemy of Karl Popper, um, the right-wing Catholic and l later prominent Nazi legal theorist and, by the way, brilliant intellectual Carl Schmitt. For Carl Schmitt's theory basically was that political power, modern political power itself, is just religious power in a different dressing. So um, that in former times in religion, um, the religion and the church had the command over miracles and this shifts in modern society to the command over the state of emergency in politics. Uh, and he had coined this very famous sentence that um, those people are the sovereigns of a country uh, that control the state of emergency. Very famous uh, conclusion of the, his political theology. So in that light, in the light of Carl Schmitt's theory, one could say that conspiracy theories are kind of reverse engineered p political theology um, because they don't just describe that. They don't just describe how, um, political, uh, how religious power gets transformed into political power, but they actively apply those uh, concepts by yeah, saying that there is something like an esoteric politics which is structured like a religion or like miracles underneath. Um, and um, to show that this concept of 
political theology is not just a right-wing Nazi racist concept. Uh, this is a famous book uh, by G. Uh, Dioris Roberts, uh, A Black Political Theo Theology from 1973, uh, which was one of the founding uh, manifestos of the American black civil rights movement, and um, which hijacked this term of political theory uh, and um, uh, applied it to the black movement, making the strong point that there is a the link between, for example, uh, if you think of Malcolm X, um, if you think of Martin Luther King or currently uh, Jesse Jackson, that there needs to be a link between theology, between priesthood and politics in the black liberation struggle in America. So one could even say that it's not just about religion becoming politics or politics becoming religious again, but one could even say that religions themselves, especially the monotheistic ones, uh, could be considered conspiracy theories um, because there are grand conspiracy theories about the origin of the world, um, of who we are, where we come from, etc. and so on. We're giving one uh, a coherent explanation of how all these pieces came together. And um, so if the religions themselves were the first conspiracy theories, then one could say um, they were conspiracy theories about nature and what the modern conspiracy theories since about the 17th century are, there are conspiracy theories about culture, namely about politics, how uh, mankind is working and not how gods are working. Um, so with this, um, we see that conspiracy theories really are interpretations of science. Okay? Inter um, in religion, um, it is an interpretation of nature of the whole cosmos as something that is symbolic. Yeah? You can trace the whole cosmos, nature, back to the word of God. Yeah? You can decode it and uh, you can read it as divine writing, as the Bible, as the Quran, as the Torah. Um, in modern conspiracy theories, it's also uh, a reading and interpretation of science, primarily words, but also images, primarily words and images as they are reported by the mass media, uh, to form a theory of a coherence and an all comprehensive uh, meaning. Um, so that means what actually happens is that in a conspiracy theory, signs of totally diverse origins are pieced together, connected, and um, they, somebody makes sense out of them against uh, a common sense. So um, you form a theory by making a particular and individual uh, interpretation of science that you read. So as such huge webs of interrelated science where everything cor corresponds to everything, where each symbol makes sense in relation to another symbol, well, 9-11 conspiracy theories really are the best example, and um, where every little detail has a higher meaning, um, you could say that conspiracy theories are something like hypersemiotics. Yeah? It's, it's almost like literary scholarship where you interp uh, interpret text and science, but you do it in a way where you create an absolute coherence even from the most accidental details. And um, if you look at a novel like Umberto Eco's uh, The Pendulum of Foucault, um, there you have precisely that plots where he talks about a giant, uh, he uh, uh, makes the fiction of a giant conspiracy theory that involves the Rosicrucians, Freemasons, and so on and so on. And of course, Eco, being a semiotician, describes this in semiotical terms because it's all origins from a piece of paper um, that uh, uh, is the origin of the conspiracy theory and in the end turns out to be, be a laundry bill. Um, so um, we could say if conspiracy theories connect everything to everything and ascribe sense to everything which even doesn't have sense, then conspiracy theories turn into belief systems themselves. Uh, belief systems that combine semiotics and political theology, so we are thrown back into the whole area of religion. And um, I think the, the best example for that is Illuminatus by um, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, probably something, uh, a book you all know, which pretty much is a pop cultural postmodernist 
clave of conspiracy theories. But if you are familiar with uh, hacker culture, also Dutch ha uh, hacker culture, um, you know that there actually in hacker culture are people who believe this. Yeah, who took this book as the gospel and turned it into a new religion. First, this uh, religion was half serious, Discordianism, and was meant to be paradistic, but there actually were people and are people who really believe this. So you have the classical example of how a conspiracy theory draws from religion and then becomes a new religion in turn. So um, if one makes sense of everything and anything, um, and focus that on one entity, one conspiracy, one meaning, uh, then using psychological terminology, one could call it paranoid or paranoid semiotics. Um, now, I don't mean this in a derogatory uh, uh, sense at all, or as a kind of, uh, I don't mean it in a cl as a cl clinical diagnosis, but I rather think of paranoia as perhaps the only form of irrationality that is perfectly rational. Um, if not overly rational, yeah? because what it is, it's irrationality that uses completely rational methods, logical methods, of drawing logical, coherent, and persuasive conclusions from observations and fact. So on, on a rhetorical level, it um, often includes seemingly unrelated uh, observations and filters only out that which doesn't f uh, fit the theory. So. It's something that is so rational that it becomes irrational because it cannot deal with irrationality. Yeah? If you cannot deal with irrationality in the world and you try to rationalize every irrationality, then your own rationalization becomes irrational again and ends up as paranoia. And um, to prove that this is not a clinical diagnosis, this is the autobiography of Andrew Grove, who is the co-founder and longtime CEO of Intel Corporation, the chip manufacturer. Uh, and that's the title, Only the Paranoid Survive. This was his management uh, uh, motto as, uh, for Intel Co uh, Corporation. Um, and you can read this book, book and he explained why. Um, well, it's the whole uh, computer industry and the whole technology industry, of course, runs on paranoia. Um, for example, IBM and Microsoft are famous for their paranoid marketing strategies, um, which are popularly uh, uh, signified with the acronym FUD for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Namely, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that you spread about competing technologies, products, and manufacturers. Um, so again, you spread paranoia in order to, to sell your product. Now, if um, we take fear, uncertainty, and doubt, they are emotions, they are sentiments. And they are emotions and sentiments that are dialectically opposed to rationalization. Yeah? There we have the flip side of it. On the one hand, you make sense. On the other hand, you have fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, so I would say these feelings of fear, uncertainty, and doubt describe really the aesthetic uh, dimension of conspiracy theories. So what do I mean with the aesthetic dimension? Um, it's the very meaning of aesthetics or aesthesis in Greek is perception or sentiment, or subjective judgment. So, um, since Greek rhetoric and since classical 18th century aesthetic philosophy, um, there is a specific term, a specific concept for fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, as an aesthetical uh, mode, namely the sublime. Uh, and um, this perhaps illustrates it a little bit. In classical aesthetics, the sublime, um, Unfortunately, I don't know the Dutch word because the English word is a bit weird. Um, can anyone help me with the Dutch word for the sublime? Huh? It, sub, sub, sublime. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, the sublime in classical aesthetics is associated with forces of nature. Storms, lightning, dangerous mo mountain ranges and canyons, dark woods. And what we see here is a painting by Turner from 1842, which depicts a snowstorm. And you can see, perhaps you can see in the middle, there is a ship on the sea in the middle of a snowstorm. Yeah? And um, it, it is really a, a, a almost archetypical depic uh, depiction of sublime nature that is overwhelming and overwhelming natural forces that threaten 
uh, the human being which is in the middle of uh, of this and um, so uh, what but what happens in the 19th century is that the sublime uh, gets detached from just nature um, if you think of gothic novels if you think of dark romanticism um, up uh, to the current gothic subculture um, then you see um, that the sublime and the threatening changes from uh, nature to culture. Uh, and the, suddenly the sublime can be something that is man-made. Um, so, um, what it is not coincidental, I think, that large-scale conspiracy theories, such as the most infamous one, the Protocols of the uh, Elders of uh, Zion, this is an uh, original uh, uh, book cover, and it's the original large-scale anti-Semitic conspiracy uh, theory, um, use are very much linked uh, to the categories of the sublime. Uh, here you again have the threatening force uh, that is uh, taking over nature and uh, threatening mankind. Um, because conspiracies and sublime uh, work on the same level in that, that they both infinite, branching out, threatening, overwhelming. So this correspondence between the aesthetics of the sublime and conspiracies becomes very obvious, I think, in Gothic murder mystery novels. If you think of Edgar Allan Poe, um, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, up to contemporary examples like Echoes, The Name of the Rose, or very contemporary example, The Da Vinci Code, yeah, is precisely using this combination of murder mystery, uh, Gothic sublime, plus conspiracy theory. Um, and extending the plot from something that is just the plot, namely the story of a novel, to a murder plot, uh, a murder conspiracy, that then extends into political plots and finally into world conspiracies. And that throws us right into the realm of underground politics. Um, you could say that in aestheticism, the sublime has always been identified with the anti-beautiful, the non-classical, and the anti-mainstream. Um, and if we look, for example, at Gothic subculture today, this is just a picture I found uh, when I looked for Gothic on, on Google image search. So that's what I get, got. And then indeed, you, if you would make an analysis of it, you could see how much it defies uh, uh, standard classical beauty norms. And, um, and the fact that you still have a Gothic uh, youth culture shows how strong um, the whole idea of the sublime as an underground uh, aesthetic is still in our age. So, um, if we talk about conspiracy theories, but their particular form of the sublime, you could say they really are, to a large extent, a countercultural phenomenon. Because they are always underground as soon as they contradict uh, official history. So what conspiracy theories do? They construct alternative realities. They disrupt the common sense truth because they come up with a completely different explanation of our current reality, uh, show up the possibility of in interpreting things radically different than in the official history, and could, I think, in the very best cases, be practical philosophical, epistemological critiques, practical critiques or hackings of our understanding what truth and reality is. And because of that, uh, conspiracy theories have been tactically employed by subcultures. Um, for example, not only that politics has been analyzed as a conspir uh, conspiracy, but also that conspiracies have been invented or simulated. Um, this here is the collective identity and media phantom Luther Blissett, uh, who didn't really exist, but anyone could act in, it, uh, in his name. And he was famous, especially in Italy in the 1990s, and people staged media pranks in his name. So he's a prime example of how you can construct a conspiracy and also sell the conspiracy theory along with the conspiracy that you uh, constructed. So it's both the analytical and the synthetical uh, conspiracy theory and the conspiracy that playfully um, um, refers to itself. And there we are in the realm of postmodernism, I think. Um, there is 
obviously a high affinity between conspiracy theories and postmodernist thinking. Maybe uh, we wouldn't have an evening about conspiracy theories here if uh, there wouldn't be a certain postmodernist influence on this whole institution. I'm just speculating. But um, since the conspiracy theory creates an alternative truth, um, the, if you take conspiracy theories as a whole in their multitude, then they all together say that there is not one truth, but that there are multiple truths. Um, and that you can distinguish the different truths just by the degrees of how persuasive they are. Um, so in other words, truth becomes a rhetorical device, something that can be manipulated and uh, for which not one secure, established uh, model does exist. And the first philosopher who put it down in, in very precise words was actually not a postmodernist, but someone from who, uh, whom all uh, postmodern philosophers uh, uh, st uh, stole, namely Friedrich Nietzsche. And, oh, what is that? Okay, there we are. So that is the conspiracy of the technology. So in, uh, in 1973, um, Nietzsche wrote a fragment called Truth and Lie. And um, the core sentence, the core paragraph of that fragment is, um, what then is truth? A mobile arm army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. So metaphors, metonyms are rhetorical figures. In short, a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm, canonical, uh, and obligatory to a people. Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. Metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power, coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. Okay. Um, so um, the full title is On Truth and Lie in an Extra Moral Sense. So Nietzsche claims that he takes a perspective beyond moral at looking at truth. But um, I think this is not true <laughs> to, use, to stay in that problematic terminology. Um, because I think there is a morality, actually, there is a morality in, in Nietzsche's statements, because what he says is that truth cannot be trusted. Um, and truth cannot be trusted because it's a rhetorical fabrication. Um, and this, I think, points out where conspiracy theories can become problematic uh, at the very point where you trust them and turn them into belief systems um, and where you lose that awareness of uh, them being rhetorical fabrications. And uh, perhaps the best literary work on that, I think, is Thomas Pynchon's novel, uh, The Crying of Lot 49, uh, from 1969. Um, which tells the tale of an underground conspirative postal uh, communication system, which pretty much could serve as uh, a model and inspiration for many subcultural communication networks and communication cultures. But in this novel, it is until the end not clear whether this conspirative underground post system really exists or whether it's only the imagination of its uh, main protagonist, a woman called Oedipa Maas. So um, what this underground system does, it communicates the message of an alternate reality just by the fact that it might exist and um, that it creates its own mythological history. But Pynchon is not st so stupid to just romanticize it and uh, um, uh, propose this as a kind of countercultural uh, utopia, but part of this uh, counterculture network is a neo Nazi uh, called Mike Fallopian, um, who is a member of the white supremacist Peter Pinguit Society. Um, at this point, it's of course absurd, it's of course grotesque, but what happens is that the conspiracy plot is no longer romantic, but be it really becomes a double edged sword. Um, you could say that conspiracy theories are no longer playful or they're no longer critical or no longer a, a way of hack reality when they A, create per, uh, paranoia about certain groups of people and B, turn into official politics. And I would say if you couple A and B, then you have precisely the uh, um, recipe of the Third Reich in Germany. Um, 
to a lesser degree. I don't want to make the comparison, but I think at least in, 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 in terms of the logic of combining uh, paranoia about groups and turning it into politics, this is true for, for extremist uh, Islamism. It's po true, but also for its counter-reaction, post-9-11 homeland security paranoia. Um, and I think it's also true of left-wing anti-globalization movements, um, which pretty much uh, operate with um, par paranoid tropes like the capitalism, the neoliberalism. And in fact, uh, you can see uh, how these, this uh, paranoia can, can turn into anti-Semitic uh, um, conspiracy theories. Again, this was taken at an anti-globalization uh, demonstration in Seattle, this photo here. Uh, where you see a caricature of uh, a devil that is both American and Israeli and Nazi and is a yeah, it's Zionist pig. You have, it's, it's practically the same illustration that we saw on the protocol uh, calls of the, the elder of, of Zion. Uh, it's repeating that, that, uh, that uh, trope. So um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, you could say if I... Um, uh, conspiracy, if conspiracy theoretical paranoia means to create a web of meanings and consider everything um, relating to everything else, then we really get into the uh, realm of networks and network theory, what Steve also talked about uh, in his introduction. Because if the network is a world wide web, uh, then you already have a paranoid trope uh, of linking everything to everything else. Uh, one could ask whether networks um, by themselves are structurally paranoid uh, uh, figures of thought, um, or at least they, they are figures that lend themselves to conspiracy theories. Um, and the internet as the network of networks this is the perfect embodiment of conspiracy theories, not just the medium, but also the subject of uh, conspiracy theories. Um, nothing, I think, shows this better tonight than uh, Sister O's um, and uh, Andrea's uh, internet-based divination performance. I just can you can can uh, strongly recommend you to get your personal oracle uh, through a numerological analysis of uh, Wikipedia and uh, find something out about yourself. Um, on uh, on the other hand, um, not only can the internet be used for conspiracy theories and uh, uh, considered. Uh, uh, something that has a paranoid structure, but it is also the subject of conspiracy theories and, and um, myths. Uh, and probably the, uh, the best known one is um, the conspiracy theory that the internet was originally designed by the military to survive a nuclear strike, which actually is an urban legend. It's not true. Um, uh, there is a whole book which disproves this popular assumption, which was coined by a journalist who mixed up uh, two different projects of the American uh, Ministry of Defense. But this urban myth become, became so popular that it's now the big conspiracy theory about the internet itself. So, and no other discipline has spun this legend of the internet more often than media theory. And media theory itself, I'm afraid, is paranoid and a conspiracy th theory to a large degree. Well, first of all, um, why is that the case? Why, why do I think that? First of all, uh, because it really inflates the term of media and medium. Um, in a way that virtually everything becomes a medium. You know, if you read Marshall McLuhan's, uh, it's, for example, light bulbs and guns and senders and receivers. Uh, if you read any media theory, there is no real definition in the sen uh, of medium in the term that it is defined. That means that there are borders. Uh, borders are drawn what is a medium and what is not a medium. If everything is a medium, um, it is, of course, very easy to conclude that we are surrounded and permeated by media. Um, but not only that, um, not only that we are uh, surrounded by media in a, in a paranoid uh, uh, state uh, of reality, but um, since Ma Marshall McLuhan's uh, influential assumption that the medium is the message, uh, media theorists believe that a medium is not actually the purveyor of a message, but the creator. Yeah? In other words, that the tool has its own agenda and that the agenda is embedded into the tool and that um, technology is not something that is cultural and constructed, 
uh, but something that has an agenda of its own, that is an, auto, uh, an autonomous agent, uh, and which thus has taken over culture and is programming us. And this is why I'm showing this picture here, because the popular science fictions of Blade Runner, Robocop, and Terminator are just the radical uh, developments of, of this kind of belief that uh, technology has taken over. So what happens uh, uh, is that media theory itself turns into a belief system that puts the technology uh, right at the place where the gods used to be before. And I think it's a dangerous proposition once it's no longer a heretic uh, provocation, because if you look at the history of media th theory in the 1960s or in the 1980s, it was first really um, pissing into the turf of classical humanities and making really strong, bold statements about media in order to challenge uh, um, goody two-shoes, humanist um, assumptions about culture. Um, but once these media theories became in institutional doctrines, um, and institutionalized, I think it is just as dangerous as um, a uh, conspiracy theory that turns from a heretic play into a new belief system. So, to wrap it up, if we think on this evening of the media themselves as one big conspiracy, um, I hope that we can put uh, conspiracy theories to a productive critical use. Thank you.